Hello, everyone. It's so wonderful to see you all. I am grateful and honored to be here. And I'm so thankful to Jessica and Daniel, the Vieira family, and the Modern Mana team for having me and my husband here to speak about something that, oh, right there. I thought you were sitting there for a second. <laughs> Where did he go? My lovely husband. To talk about a subject that we're both very passionate about, which is brain health. So thank you for being here. And I'm really thrilled to talk about our work, the latest research and the science behind brain health, and specifically talk about nutrition. As you may know, the brain is probably the most important organ in our body. We kind of get in a little bit of an argument with our cardiologist friends or people who are GI specialists. We say, no, the brain is the most important one. And they're like, no, our organ is more important. But when you think about it, at the end of the day, the thoughts that we have, the memories that we have, the habits that we own are us. It is us at the day. The language that we use is a representation of who we are. So we really ought to take care of this magnificent organ. And guess what? It is under your control. There's a lot of confusing information as far as brain health is concerned. There's a lot of gimmicks too. And so I hope that in the next hour that we're going to spend time together, I'll be able to show you what's been going on in the world of neuroscience and neurology and what can we do on a regular basis, on a day-to-day -day basis, to take care of this brilliant organ. And with that, I have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not going to take a very long time. I would love to actually have some time to uh, do a Q&A and answer your questions because it's in the Q&A that wonderful uh, conversations and discussions arise. Uh, my lovely husband yesterday spoke about brain health. I see a lot of new friendly faces, but if you were here yesterday, Dean spoke about the three pound universe. So our brain is kind of squishy and gelatinous. If you hold it in your hands, it's kind of gross. You know, your fingers are probably going to go inside it. It's that soft. And it's only about, you know, three pounds. It's about 2% of your body's weight. But at any moment, it can consume up to 25% of your body's energy. That's a very, very active organ. And like any other machine or any other active organ, when you're that active, what happens? You need more energy, you need more care, you need better fuel, and you need some rest. So that should give you a hint of how important it is to take care of the brain. It's always on. Even when we're sleeping, our brain is on, believe it or not. It does not shut down. And it has 87 billion neurons, which are brain cells. But the key to brain health is not the number of cells that we have. It's the connections between these cells that matter the most. And we'll talk about that more. Because each cell can make as little as two connections between each other or as many as 30,000 connections. And these connections are made and broken down on a regular basis. Whether you're two years old, whether you're 22, 92, 102, and so on and so forth. So this should give us some empowering information that yes, we can increase the connections between these beautiful brain cells. Now, we talked about the neuro plan yesterday. And for those of you who weren't here, when you look at lifestyle and brain health, there are five elements that stand out. Nutrition, so we created the self-serving acronym because we're both neurologists, so neuro. N stands for nutrition. E stands for exercise. U stands for unwind or good and bad stress. R stands for restorative sleep. And O stands for optimizing cognitive activities or brain building, being connected to some mental activity in a social environment like this one. And so Dean talked about exercise, unwind, restore, and optimize. And today I'm going to take a deep dive into nutrition. Why? Well, it's important, but there's also a lot of misinformation out there. It can get very confusing sometimes. I mean, how many of you hear a news a week about, you know, superfood of the day for brain health? All the time, don't we? 
whether it's the search engines or you get emails or you listen to some news about the latest vitamin or the vitamin concoction. It's just being, we're being bombarded for things that we can do to improve our memory, consciousness, processing speed. So which one is true and which one is not? So I hope that I can actually show you some of our research and find out, you know, what is it that we need to do? Science is very important because that's how we can translate it into our lives, how we can actually understand the elements of what we need to do every single day. So let me go ahead and show you a few papers that are very important that have actually created a better understanding of what we need to do as far as nutrition is concerned. So food is the most important internal environment. And we have an external environment and we have an internal environment. What we put in our body three or four times a day, or five times if you snack a lot, determines the building blocks of our brain. Now nutrients, whether it's from fruits and vegetables or whole grains and legumes, they protect our brain or they can damage our brain. They protect it by fighting against oxidative stress. It's a process where byproducts start destroying cells and the connections. And it can reduce inflammation, Inflammation is important. That's how the body fights against infections and damage. But when it's too much, it starts getting damaged significantly. But when we eat the right kinds of foods, you actually help reduce that inflammation and allow your brain to grow, allow those connections to grow and for your brain to thrive. There was a time when people would focus more on vitamins. Oh, vitamin E is important, vitamin C is important, this micronutrient like iron is important, magnesium is important. But scientists are now shying away from that kind of research because we don't eat one vitamin or one micronutrient at a time. We eat food, right? You don't eat vitamin C, you eat lemons. You don't eat fiber, you eat an apple. You don't eat protein, you eat beans, right? So we don't pick and choose specific nutrients. And it's the synergy between these nutrients, fiber with vitamin E, omega-3 fatty acids with vitamin B12, it's the synergy that matters more. And there are certain foods that provide this synergistic relationship between the nutrients in a beautiful way and in a very delicious way, I must say. So I, I will bring on taste over and over again because I went to culinary school. So for me, taste is incredibly important and we'll talk about that later. All right, some research to show you guys some salient features of what we have learned so far as far as nutrition is concerned. Now, you probably have heard that the brain is made of fat, so we have to eat fat. How many of you have heard that? A lot of us, right? And there are these talking heads on social media that say fat is important, you can't stop eating fat because the brain is made out of fat. That's true. 60% of our brain is fat, but it doesn't mean we should be gorging a lot of fat. And not all fats are the same. There are good fats and there are bad fats. The bad fats are saturated fats and trans fatty acids that are found in processed foods. And the good fats are polyunsaturated fats and unsaturated fats found in plants. And there's more information about how to eat and what types of fats to eat. Like for example, this one, the Chicago Health and Aging Project Tremendous research for a long, long time. This was a longitudinal study that was tested in 2,500 individuals, and it went on and on for years. It still is going on. And they found that consumption of saturated fats and trans fatty acids that are found in processed foods over a six-year period was associated with a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. And those that ate fats from plants like seeds, avocados, extra virgin olive oil, they actually did wet better. They had lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. Another study from the Adventist Health Study where Dean and I work, we both work at Loma Linda University. Back in 1993, Dr. Paul Guillaume, he studied vegetarians and non-vegetarians and he found out that individuals, this was 3,000 of them, those who consumed meat, which is a major source of saturated fats, including chicken, cheese, and poultry, had twice the risk of developing dementia compared to those who were vegetarians. And it makes sense again, good fats coming from plants are healthy and neuroprotective. Bad fats coming from saturated fats and trans fatty acids actually are harmful and they increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Another study from Kaiser Permanente Northern California study in almost 10,000 people, they found out that those who had high cholesterol during their midlife, and you know, cholesterol is total cholesterol, but specifically LDL cholesterol, 
when their cholesterol was high, they had a 57% increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And even moderate levels of LDL cholesterol increased the risk by 23%. And this is midlife. And one thing that we now understand is that Alzheimer's disease or dementia does not start at the point of having memory problems. It actually starts 20 or 30 years earlier, but the brain kind of slowly and gradually gives up and the symptoms manifest after 20 or 30 years. So it's critically important to take care of our vascular risk factors like blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, insulin resistance as early as we can, but it's never too late. So I don't want to kind of make this a negative, but it's never too late to take care of our health, but it's also very important for those of us in our 20s and 30, 30s who think that we're completely invincible and this rule doesn't really apply to us, it does. It applies to 10-year-olds, it applies to 16-year-olds who are in high school, it applies to each and every one of us. As a matter of fact, I know I didn't have a slide here, but they found, in one of the recent studies, they found that 9-year-olds who were living in an unhealthy life, meaning they were eating a lot of processed foods, even they had white matter disease in their brains. Can you believe that? Our children, I have a 15-year-old and a 17-year-old, and just the thought of it, that they could be exposed to that kind of a condition scares me. It really does. So it's a, it's a, it's a big problem and there's a lot we can do about it. All right, another study from the Women's Health Study, this is in Harvard University in Boston. 6,000 women followed for four years. Again, same thing. They found that women who consumed higher amounts of saturated fats, they had a poor memory and they had a faster decline in their cognition. 70% faster compared to women who ate unsaturated fats or plants or reduced fat in total. And when they looked at their brains, because they did a lot of MRI scans and neuropsychological testing, meaning testing their memory, their brain function was that of six years younger, of a person six years younger. So not only did they function better, their brains actually looked better too. It's incredible. Another one from my mentors in Columbia University, we actually studied the impact of diet in different populations, whether it was the Hispanic population or the African-American population. The message was the same. Individuals who consumed more plant-based diet, they had lower risk of cognitive decline over a span of six years. But you know what? The effects start immediately. It actually starts showing itself within weeks and months. We actually see it in our clinic, how cholesterol levels decline, sugar levels or sugar metabolism improves with a plant-based diet, depending on their baseline health, of course. I know we're talking about Alzheimer's disease, but I'd like to touch on stroke as well. I'm a stroke specialist. I'm a vascular neurologist, which means that I treat strokes when people come in with symptoms of stroke, whether it's you know, paralysis of one side of their body or inability to speak or loss of vision or numbness and tingling on one side of their body. We actually have certain medications that we can give them within that period. But a lot of strokes go unnoticed. There is a term called silent strokes. And Nobody's really talking about it because it's an epidemic. People tend to have small vascular damage in their brain over many, many years if they have unhealthy lifestyles, if they have uncontrolled vascular risk factors. And it doesn't necessarily end up you know, with symptoms that would force them to go to the emergency room to seek health. But over time, they have cognitive decline. So vascular cognitive impairment or vascular dementia is the second most common type of dementia where people tend to have slowing of their thoughts and thinking process and memory problems because of damage to the arteries that supply oxygen and nutrition to the different parts of the brain. If you could pay attention to the slides, the one on the left-hand side shows these big blobs of silent strokes. And when you look at another sequence of the MRI of the same person, you can actually see way more. It looks like small little black dots. And this is an example of silent stroke that happens over a long period of time without manifesting with you know, symptoms of stroke that we're used to. Paralysis of one side or numbness or tingling or drooping of the face or loss of language. So it's critical to know that we do have control of our vascular health as well. One of the studies that I was involved with was a California teacher study. It's a huge um, database of women in Southern California, actually all of California. And what we did was we wanted to look at the relationship between diet and 
brain health, specifically stroke outcomes. So we did some analysis and we found that 3,000 individuals had stroke within a confined period. They both had ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes. These are the two types of strokes. One is related to clots and one happens when there's bursting of arteries. And we found that we looked at data and a dietary database, and we constructed the Mediterranean diet score. And I'll talk to you guys about what Mediterranean diet is. But we found out that when women consumed Mediterranean diet, they had reduced risk of stroke, up to 44% reduced risk of stroke, just diet. It's incredible, not exercise, not, not including anything else, you know, other healthy factors. Just diet reduced the risk of stroke by 44%, both ischemic and hemorrhagic. And when you look at the Mediterranean diet stroke, uh, Mediterranean diet scoring system, it sounds very exotic. Ooh, Mediterranean, people think, well, it's probably, you know, somewhere in Italy, maybe somebody's sitting there with a beautiful plate of pasta, some cheese, some wine, you know, and some uh, violin in the background. No, no. When you look at the scoring system, this is what it looks like. People get a high score when they consume vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts and seeds, legumes, which is beans and lentils, Mono and polyunsaturated fats, good fats that come from vegetables, and fish or a source of omega-3 fatty acids, not necessarily fish. Fish is consumed as a source of omega-3 fatty acids, which is also found in chia seeds, hemp seeds, flax seeds, etc. And they got a low score when they consume meat, poultry, and dairy, or sources of saturated fats. This is what Mediterranean diet actually looks like. So what does it look like? So it looks like a plant-based diet, doesn't it? Then in uh, Rush University, um, Dr. Martha Morris, fabulous scientist who's not with us anymore, she came up with the concept of the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. Now, the MIND diet stands for Mediterranean, Interven Mediterranean Dash Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. It's a mouthful. But the MIND diet is a hybrid of the Mediterranean diet and another kind of a diet called DASH diet, dietary approach to stop hypertension. So she basically put all of these together and she did some statistical analysis to see, okay, fine, great, plants are great, but what foods are better? What foods are better? And how can people eat even minimum amount of a dietary pattern and do very well? So the MIND diet actually showed us that when people consume it and they are strictly adherent to it, they can reduce their risk of Alzheimer's disease by 50%. 53%. What medicine do you know that does that? Nothing. We don't have any medication for this devastating disease. And yet we do know, and we have known for a long time, that there are dietary patterns that can reduce the risk of this devastating disease by 53%. And even moderate adherence to the diet reduced the risk by 35%. Plus, again, in this study, they actually looked at the brain of individuals eating this kind of diet, and they found that those who had high adherence to the diet, they had cognitive functioning equivalent to a person who was seven and a half years younger seven and a half years younger. That's incredible. I know I get very excited about this data, but it's, it's empowering, isn't it? And these individuals were between the ages of 58 to 98. So we have the power at any age to change the course of our health and take care of our brain. When you look at Mediterranean diet and the MIND diet, the Mediterranean diet pyramid has been studied extensively. So the MIND diet, what they did was they increased certain things and reduced other food products. What did they increase? Three ser servings of whole grains, like brown rice, like oats, like you know, uh, barley. At least one dark leafy green salad per day or one serving of it. That's not much. We can all do that, right? Berries. At least twice a week, we can definitely do that. One ounce serving of nuts daily. Fantastic. Beans and legumes daily. We talked about beans yesterday. I made a, um, a chickpea butternut squash curry. I don't know if you guys were here, but we talked about lectins and all this misinformation about lectins being bad for you. They're not. They're not. That was just such a misinformation. And vegetables, all kinds of colorful vegetables that are packed with polyphenols, packed with anti-inflammatory and antioxidant compounds. What was reduced was the the emphasis on fish or omega-3 fatty acids was reduced. Chicken was down, cheese was down, asking people to switch from butter to extra virgin olive oil because that's a good source. Polyunsaturated fats are good for you. 
And they did mention wine, but then alcohol is actually not a good thing for brain. And I'm sorry, we're, I know we're in wine country, but you know, we've, we lo we've lost a lot of friends when it comes to uh, the conversation about wine or, or alcohol in general. The polyphenols that they talk about or the resveratrol that they talk about in, in wine, you can actually get that from grape juice. You can get that from all kinds of fruits. So, but alcohol is neurotoxic and there's enough evidence now that shows that we don't really have to drink alcohol at all. And that's, that was quite confusing for many, many years. All right, so that was clarification. So wine is gone, and essentially the pyramid looks like this, which is fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lots and lots of green leafy vegetables, berries, and sources of omega-3 fatty acids, which could come from plants. Now, let me just talk a little bit about fish. There really isn't any good data suggesting that fish is bad for us, but we worry. We worry because animals are bioconcentrators, and we're dumping so many chemicals and toxic substances in our oceans. And fish concentrate these toxins. And the only toxins out of the thousands that they're exposed to, we only check two, mercury and lead. That's it. And that could actually concentrate in our bodies. And there have been studies that when people consume them, their mercury and lead levels actually go up. So we say that is a big concern, but it's so easy to get omega-3 fatty acids from chia seeds and flax seeds. There's two systematic reviews that we have conducted and they're about to be published. They're, and it, it seems that there are two uh, particular situations or stages in our lives when omega-3 fatty acids are very important. One is for the growing brain, so children, especially in the intrauterine life, as well as after they're born for the first five years because the brain is growing tremendously during that stage. So it's important to be aware of it. And then later on in life, especially for people who have the beginnings of some cognitive impairments, a mild cognitive impairment, it seems that supplementation with omega-3 fatty acids, DHA, could be helpful. But they can be derived from algae-based omega-3, which has almost no mercury or lead, and they're definitely lower than toxins because they're plants. As a matter of fact, DHA is derived from algae, but the poor fish eat them and then we get them from the fish. So completely get rid of the middleman and get it from the algae. But for the rest of us, I think if we eat a healthy diet with some nuts and seeds, I think we're okay. We get enough omega-3 fatty acids, which is probably the most important fat for the brain. As far as supplements are concerned, there've been multiple studies that looked at clinical trials where groups of people were given concoctions of vitamins or specific vitamins like vitamin B12, like vitamin D. Um, and the results show that it's best for us to derive them from food. But, but there is one thing about vitamin B12, and I know that um, you guys heard about it yesterday as well. About 41% of the population, regardless of whether they're plant-based or not plant-based, are vitamin B12 deficient. So it's something that we need to be very aware of you don't have to pay a lab outside of your medical insurance. It's easily tested. And checking your vitamin B12 at least once a year is important. And knowing your numbers is important. And keeping that normal is very, very important for brain health and for nerve health. And for those of us who are exclusively plant-based, which means we don't eat any animal products like the Dean and I, we take a vitamin B12 supplement every day. It's cheap, it's available everywhere, and it keeps our vitamin B12 high, and we don't worry about it. As far as vitamin D is concerned, there are a lot of studies coming out showing that vitamin D deficiency has been associated with uh, increased risk of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. So again, vitamin D levels should be checked, and we should be aware of them. Omega-3 fatty acids, I spoke about it. For individuals later in life, and those who have the APOE4 gene, that's a gene that increases risk for Alzheimer's disease. It's important for them to consider taking an algae-based omega-3 um, uh, supplementation, um, especially later in life. And for other micronutrients, vitamin C, vitamin E, some minerals like iron, magnesium, phosphorus, zinc, I could go on and on. It's best to get them from food rather than supplementation. So that's, that's a very summarized version of a whole lot of data. We made a curry yesterday during the cooking demonstration, and I talked a lot about turmeric. Now, turmeric is something that keeps coming back over and over again, and this was one of the studies that Dean and I were involved in, and uh, it came out last year. We looked at what curcumin does 
to our brain. Curcumin is one of the 4,000 compounds in turmeric. And what happens is we found that when people consume turmeric, or specifically curcumin, it binds to amyloid protein. Amyloid protein is the bad protein that has been associated with Alzheimer's disease. And we think that it may lower amyloid burden. Obviously, there's, more, there's need for more research to be done, but there's something potent um, about turmeric. There's something really tremendously important as far as its anti-inflammatory characteristics are concerned. So we say, if you can, if you don't hate curries, I can't imagine who hates curries, but if you can, please add turmeric to your foods, whether it's in an almond latte or in your food, or you can have a turmeric dressing on your greens, that would be wonderful. And it's also noted that uh, piperin, which is a black pepper extract, increases the absorption or the bioavailability of turmeric by 2,000%. So if you can't eat turmeric, Consider taking a turmeric supplement. It's not for everyone. There are a lot of people who may have some um, sensitivities or some health conditions that could exacerbate their health problems. For example, having gallstones or, for example, having some liver disease. So it's very important to run it by your physician before you embark on taking turmeric supplementation. Right. So l let's talk about nutrients in general. I wanted to add a couple of slides about food specifically and do a little bit of myth busting. Now, a lot of people, they refer to food as protein, carbs, and fats. You've probably heard us say that over and over again. We don't refer to food as apples and oranges and spinach and bread. We say, this is my protein and this is my carb. But it doesn't, it's, it's not right. Because when you look at foods, okay, so what are the main three macronutrients. We have fats, we have proteins, and we have carbohydrates. And each food that we have in our lives, and I know that most of us eat probably the same kind of foods. I don't know if you were here yesterday. We'll have dinner today. It would be amazing. But when you look at food, it's a combination of all of these things. It's very, very rare for one food to be a representation of one category. For example, yes, a processed oil might be 100% fat and nothing else, right? But for the most part, food is a mixture of fat, protein, and carbohydrates. Now, what are some of the best sources of this particular group? For carbohydrates, based on all of the research that is done, I just kind of wanted to summarize them. Best sources of carbohydrates, which are so important because there are a source of energy for our body and especially for our brains. People have vilified carbs. You know, people say carbs and you always think of something really bad. But carbohydrates are not all the same. We have complex carbohydrates and we have simple carbohydrates. Complex carbohydrates are things like brown rice, quinoa, barley, oats, whole wheat pasta, fruits, vegetables, beans, lentils, peas, etc. And then the refined carbohydrates are the ones that we need to reduce significantly. And these are things like white bread, white pasta, or products that contain white flour. You know, unfortunately, all the delicious baked goods. But if you can make it with whole wheat bread, whole wheat uh, flour, that's amazing. Candy, sweets, sugar sweetened beverages, these are all representatives of simplified carbohydrates that we need to avoid. What about protein? Protein is incredibly important for growth, for tissue repair, for immune function, for making essential hormones, energy in the absence of carbohydrates, and preserving our muscles. So it's incredibly important, and they're considered the building block of the body. But they're good proteins, and then they're bad kind of proteins. But all in all, amino acids, you know, people always think that there is, um, there's only a particular type of protein that we need to have for the body to absorb it better? No. Essential amino acids, you know, or amino acids are found in everything. They're found in plants. So we can actually get these amino acids from all kinds of plants. And the good kind of proteins come from, oh, actually, I have a slide to show that the amino acids are these. So histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, lots of big names. But we have, you know, these particular amino acids. Nine of them cannot be made by the body, so we need to consume them on a regular basis. Rarely will you ever see a deficiency of protein in this country. You will probably see it in places where people are exposed to famine and starvation. Um, malnutrition is a thing, but it's usually not because of proteins. 
in the United States. Malnutrition may be because of not getting enough vitamins or not getting enough fiber, believe it or not. I think there's a fiber malnutrition going on in our country. So things like kosher core, which is a disease where the belly swells up, especially in children when they're, um, when they're starving, those are seen in, uh, in, in, not in the United States, those are seen in countries where starvation is very prominent. How much protein do we need? For a healthy adult, 0.8 grams to one gram per body weight in kilograms. So that probably means about 56 to 68 grams for someone who is 150 pounds. What are the best sources? Lentils, beans. Soy products like tofu, tempeh, edamame, soy milk, nuts, seeds, nut butter, seed butters, whole grains, brown rice, quinoa, oats, like I said earlier. So there's no shortage of great sources of protein in the plant-based world. What should we avoid based on the information that we have? Red meat, poultry, high fat dairy, and processed meat specifically. All right, let's talk about fats. They're very important, again, uh, for energy reserves, for hormone creation, for protection of our organs, and for absorption of critical vitamins. They're very high in calorie, and we need to limit them to have optimal body weight. Now, there are essential fatty acids and non-essential fatty acids. What makes them essential? It means that the body needs them to create the right environment for the body to grow and thrive and for the brain to function appropriately, specifically. Non-essential fatty acids are cholesterol, saturated fats, and trans fatty acids, which come from mostly animal products and processed foods. Essential fatty acids are omega-3, omega-6, and the different types of omega-3 fatty acids are DHA, EPA, and ALA. DHA is the one that I was talking earlier about, where you get algae-based omega-3 fatty acids, DHA, that is critically important for brain health. EPA is also important, but not as important as DHA. ALA is the kind of omega-3 fatty acid that is found in chia seeds and flax seeds and hemp seeds that get converted to EPA and DHA. So focusing on the essential ones and trying to stay away from the non-essential one is important. Again, best sources, nuts, seeds, avocados, extra virgin olive oil. Now put a little star over there to make sure that we know that these are very high calorie foods. I think we are dealing with an excess of calories in our food. So making sure that we limit it and making sure that we only eat the amount that our body needs for better functioning is important. Avoiding butter, cream cheese, fats on meat, poultry, fried foods, you get the idea. All right, fiber. Let's talk about fiber. Where is fiber found? There was a time when we thought that fiber was just one of those like powders where you mixed in your cup and water. But back then when I was growing, that's what I thought fiber was. But thank goodness I grew up and I learned more that fiber is found in all of plant kingdom. Vegetables, fruits, whole grains, they all have fiber and it is such an important element of our diet. It is, a not, it is not a source of calorie, believe it or not. It's, you know, whatever carbohydrates that we consume, the net carbohydrates um, actually get rid or, or the fiber is actually subtracted from the net calories that we get from carbohydrates. It's important because it feeds our microbiome. We have bacteria in our gut. We actually have bacteria, more bacteria in our body than we have cells. And these bacteria, they have a symbiotic relationship with us, with each and every cell. And feeding them is incredibly important. We all need at least 25 to 40 grams of fiber per day, depending on whether we're a woman or a man. But the typical Western diet, the typical American diet has only about 15 grams of fiber. So we're really not getting enough. How do we get more of it? By eating more fruits and vegetables, non-digestible carbohydrates. So we have soluble fiber and non-soluble fiber. Soluble fiber is the fermentable one, which is used by the good bacteria. And the non-fermentable one, it does not dissolve in fluid, but it creates the bulk in our, in our gut and it keeps us satiated. That's why when you eat a big bowl of salad, it might be 300 or 400 calories, but then a small donut like that is also about 340 calories. You're gonna fill yourself up with those, with those vegetables, but the donut might not fill you up. So we need fiber to feel full and for those gut bacteria to thrive. What are the benefits? 
It optimizes the friendly gut bacteria. It can cause weight loss. It actually contains specific types of um, starches that will give us the feeling of fullness. It will lower our glycemic index. It will actually metabolize glucose better. It can even lower cholesterol. There's a type of fiber that lowers our cholesterol. It has a laxative effect and it lowers the risk of gut issues, including colon cancer. So I think it's important for us to eat food rather than focusing on carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, and that's the best way to live. Focus on foods, unprocessed foods, and mostly on fiber. An example of that is quinoa. Now, what is quinoa? You can't call it a carbohydrate because it does have, you can't call it a protein. Believe it or not, quinoa is a complete protein because it contains all of the nine essential amino acids. And it provides a whole lot of protein, but also fat and carbohydrate. That was a beautiful example of how we should focus on food and not nutrients. So what is the best dietary pattern for brain health? With all the information that we have, it seems that an unprocessed, whole, plant-based, or not necessarily plant-based, at least a plant-predominant diet is the best diet for brain health. Mono and polyunsaturated fats derived from plants are better than saturated fats. Plant proteins derived from beans and legumes and soy products are much better than animal products. Making sure that we focus on complex carbohydrates and not completely get rid of carbs from our diet. And then if anyone wants to a cooking oil, it seems that cooking oils derived from plants are much better than butter and sources of saturated fats, including coconut oil. I know. I get, I get a lot of questions about whether coconut oil is good because there was a time when it was promoted as a health food. But unfortunately, it was only a one anecdote. It was an N of one. And somebody gave coconut oil to their husband and their husband who had Alzheimer's disease got better. But then, you know, bless his soul, I don't know what happened after that. But that just started this whole stream of misinformation that coconut was supposedly a healing food. It's not. Coconut food, uh, coconut oil actually has a lot of saturated fats, just like butter and cream do. So reducing it is incredibly important. All right. What are some of the seven rules? I know, some rules here. But I think it's important to know, and we've included this in our book, The 30-Day Alzheimer's Solution. If there are seven things that you can remember about food and brain health, it's here. Eating a plant-based or a plant-predominant uh, diet, including the Neuro9 foods, which we'll talk about later. Avoiding foods that are high in saturated fats. Avoiding refined carbohydrates. So simple sugars, white flour, white pasta, white rice, and eating brown rice and whole wheat flour. Reducing salt and seasoning our food with herbs and spices. Avoiding processed foods and eating more unprocessed ones. Drinking water, yes, we actually included that because it is so important to stay hydrated for better brain function. And the seventh one was eating homemade meals. There is something magical about cooking your own food. And I know that a lot of us are busy and we have children to raise and we have communities to take care of. But making sure that we have some time to prepare food allows us to understand the relationship between our health and what we prepare for ourselves, to have everything under control. And I don't mean, you know, sweating your way in the, in the kitchen, something that is really quick. And if you look at our recipes, they're mostly 15 to 20 minutes, quick weekday recipes. But I do believe in preparation and batch cooking as well. So how do you prepare? What are some of the steps for better brain health when it comes to nutrition? Science is very important. Everything we say is based on scientific evidence. Uh, but what does that mean when it comes to day-to-day -day life? And how do you make those changes? Those are the things that Dean and I are very passionate about. And that's what our work focuses in different communities, translation of true science in communities. So we created these 12 steps. Number one is planning. Plan where you are, know where you are in your journey, and take the proper steps. What do you like? What do you dislike? Is it even feasible for you? What are your favorite foods? Do you have any help? Noting these down, like any other plant, the first step is preparation and creating a game plan. Second step is cleaning your pantry. I believe your pantry is 
your source of food. Whatever you have in your pantry, you'll probably have it in your plain plate as well. Now, I don't want you guys to get rid of all of your foods in the pantry. We, we don't want to do that. But consciously filling your pantry with foods that are healthy would be great. And consciously getting rid of foods that are unhealthy is also important. Out of sight, out of mind. If you have a bag of Cheetos in my kitchen, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to eat it. But if I don't bring it, or if I don't buy cookies, if I don't buy junk food, I probably won't eat it. We're very simplistic. Dean actually has a beautiful talk about behavior and about habits, and he'll go into it in detail. Be an expert in reading labels. Know what's in the labels. Know what you're supposed to eat. Try to understand serving sizes, what saturated fat is, what unsaturated fat is. There's a lot of confusion there, but once you actually get a hang of it, you will be the best detective in the world. Invest in jars, invest in things that actually show you what you have so that things are not hidden behind compartments. I'm giving a lot of information of how I used to be, but th having things clearly in front of you will make it easy for you to decide what to eat and what not to eat. And cleaning out your pantry once a month. All right, step three is cleaning your fridge. I have to be honest, nobody's fridge looks like that. That was probably somebody with OCD, right? Mine doesn't look like that at all. But I do spend some time every week to clean the refrigerator. For example, I have these beautiful, you know, containers, glass containers that are made out of glass. So I can see, oh, I'm running out of shredded carrots. I'm running out of cabbage. I'm running out of cilantro, you know. So keeping things visible instead of stuffing them in plastic bags and then they rot behind in the, you know, in the, in the little uh, drawer and then you find out after you smell the mold, right? So having everything clean and visible in your refrigerator is very, very important. Making snacks available. You know, I would like to snack if something is as beautifully prepared as that. I probably will eat some carrots and some cucumbers with a beautiful dip if it's beautifully placed like that. We actually eat with our eyes first. That's one thing that I learned at, at cooking school. I used to say, gosh, they spent so much time on making food beautiful. Who cares? Just give it to me. I'm really hungry. But we do eat with our eyes. And if it's few, food is available, if it's presentable, and if it's right there in front of you, you will eat it. And if it's colorful. So it's important. Um, grocery shopping. Believe it or not, it's a skill. It's very important to stay away from processed foods. How do you do that? You actually have to eat before shopping. There have been studies where they showed that when people are thirsty or if they're hungry before going grocery shopping, they tend to go and buy very processed foods because your brain actually just is drawn towards something that will satiate you, that has a lot of sugar, that has a lot of salt in it. So eating before shopping is important. Having a list and sticking to it. Shop from the outside in because the outside is usually the produce and the aisles, the inside are usually processed foods. Just buying the amounts that you need only for a week or two weeks, depending on your family. Less canned and packaged foods, more fresh foods, more foods that you can prepare. I hear you, I heard that. All right. Organic, when possible. And I say that with great humility. Uh, it, you know, as far as data on organic foods are concerned, there have been studies that show that um, PCBs or, you know, um, uh, foods that are not organic, they may raise certain chemicals in our bloodstream and they have been associated with certain diseases. There have been some papers that show that Parkinson's disease uh, risk goes up when people are not eating organic foods. But for the majority of neurological conditions, including Alzheimer's disease, the data is not clear. So we say if you can afford organic food because it's extremely expensive and us, Dean and I working in disparities communities, we say do your best to eat organic food, but if you can't afford organic food, don't worry about it. Just eat vegetables, just eat fruits. Don't have to worry about that at all. All right. And more varieties of vegetables, of course. Step five is batch cooking. You know, picking one day of the week and cooking your staples. Bake your sweet potatoes make a big pot of black beans, make a big pot of brown rice, cut up your vegetables and have it ready so that every day you don't have to spend an hour in the kitchen and you can put things together. Dean and I, we spend three hours every Sunday. We go to the grocery store and the farmer's market, get our stuff, 
make everything ready, and then the rest of the week, we just modify it. We make a stir fry or we make a veggie bake out of the same staple foods that we've created. So batch cooking makes things easy. Oops, went back, all right. Eating at work, you know, with the pandemic being over and all of us going out, we are exposed to different foods. So we have to be our own brain health ambassadors. We really can't expect institutions and our jobs and our environments to change. So we really need to stand up for ourselves and know our environment very well. Know where that vending machine is and stay away from it at 2 or 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Know what the cafeteria offers. Know what times hunger hits you. Know when it's time for you to snack and be ahead of the game. Prepare. Take a meal with you. Plan a meal for the week when you're at work. Eat at specific times and just kind of in your mind say, the kitchen is closed. The kitchen is closed. I'm not going to eat anything until I get home. And these small little habits actually will become such empowering core values for you as you move on. I'm stealing some of your lines from your talk. Eating at restaurants. You know, it's important for us to actually know what restaurants we go to. A lot of restaurants offer things that we may not be comfortable with or that are not good for our brain. So just kind of going to their website and nowadays, you know, you could just pull things out and Yelp and check out their menu and see if they have anything that is good. It's important to do some research ahead of time. But if you don't have control over it, a lot of times, you know, people at restaurants can modify things for you. You can actually combine things. I usually stick to, most of the time, I stick to the sides menu. Oh, can I have some sta- a sauteed um, you know, uh, spinach with some broccoli? Could you please tell the chef to add some brown rice in it for me? Could you please skip the butter in this pasta and just ext- uh, add extra virgin olive oil? I'm not going to eat that Alfredo sauce because it's too, it's too full of you know, dairy products and saturated fats, could you please just make it with some marinara sauce for me? Instead of this, could you just add some basil for some herbs? And, and they'd be more than happy to do that for you. So ask the chef or the cook or the person to mix and match for you. Eating at gatherings can be really challenging, right? I mean, Thanksgiving used to be scary for us for a very long time, but it's such a beautiful holiday and you don't want to disappoint anyone. And your mom and your aunt and your uncle and your grandpa and your grandma work so hard to make beautiful food for you and you just feel so uncomfortable and disrespectful but a great thing would be to take your own food make a beautiful side dish and take it with you or you know tell them ahead of time like listen you know this I've actually started cutting down on this particular food I'm not eating butter anymore or I'm reducing my meat consumption or I'm eating more plant-based would it be possible for me to bring a butternut squash dish or would it be possible for me to actually make a beautiful tempeh loaf or a lentil loaf instead of you know the regular turkey so you can have conversations and most of us have very compassionate family members so they'll understand replace don't eliminate (laughs) i love the side comments (laughs) i love it replace don't eliminate it's not about deprivation it is not about deprivation as you can as you saw from some of the examples that i provided we have so many amazing options to eat you know this is not about deprivation or feeling uh uh feeling left out from joy because food is joy Food is company, food is stories, food are memories of what we were raised with. It's just redefining it. So replace, don't eliminate. Replacements are available for anything, for everything. And also, you know, exploring different foods. Believe it or not, I made this a, um, a step. Make your own dressings and sauces. Why? Because most of the dressings and sauces that we're fed are just packed with a lot of poor fats, lots of salt and sugar. So knowing how to make some good sauces, like a cannellini bean white sauce that goes really, really well with whole wheat pasta, or for example, making an almond chipotle sauce that goes beautifully on black beans and avocados and a burrito, or making a cashew cream sauce instead of the regular sauces, instead of regular curries that have a lot of saturated fats are important. But if you do have to buy some dressings and sauces, make sure you read the labels. Adding healthy snacks is another step. When you add healthy snacks, say for example, if you're consuming more cucumbers and carrots and apples and grapes and some nuts and seeds, guess what? You're less likely to go to that vending machine. You're less likely to actually go and get that chocolate bar or the candy bar from the grocery store, from the, uh, you know, the gas station. So having that ready, whether you're at home or at work, it makes things very easy. And the last one, know thy pitfalls. We all have pitfalls. We all have those weak moments where we fall off the wagon. 
where we actually tend to go and do things that are harmful. <laughs> you like that picture? Yeah. So that may be change in energy. And even when we're, you know, we work with a lot of individuals who want to start going towards a plant-based diet and they say, I just can't do it after a week. I feel ill. I feel unwell. I feel like I have no energy. And obviously, change is difficult. Changing habits are very, very difficult. But knowing those weak moments, knowing things that help will tremendously help. It's, it's much easier if you're in a community, if you have some supporters, if you have friends who will go along with it with you. But knowing what the pitfalls are, you know, those moments when I'm really hungry, I don't have time to go and fix myself a healthy meal, I might fall. So having something ready at those moments. Or for example, I literally had to change walking from a corridor because I could smell the muffins from the cafeteria. So it would take a different corridor to get to my office at times. I know that's wacky, but I did it and you have to. Know what are some of the situational pressures Know some people that make you say, like, oh, come on, just, just one more. It doesn't matter. Let's go ahead and do it. Know those people. Know the friends. Know the individuals around you who want the best for you or they just want to enjoy that moment and they don't really want to look at the longer picture or the bigger picture. So a good meal can be like that. I'm showing off. Uh, this is from our 30-day Alzheimer's. So this is a lentil beet burger with chipotle cheese. Isn't that beautiful? And that's holy bread. Now that's a curried cauliflower bowl with pistachios and uh, vegetables. That's a beautiful chia pudding with rose water, strawberries, and pomegranate. That's, that's what we ate for dinner a couple of days ago. That's a chickpea pita pocket. It's beautiful. It's delicious. That's a beautiful barley soup that Dean makes for us um, once or twice a month. That's an almond cheese that we have for breakfast. It's packed with herbs, basil, thyme, sometimes rosemary. That's my snack at work. That's an orange chocolate truffle covered with pistachios. <laughs> so, so food can be nourishing. Food can be medicine. Food can be fulfilling. We're really proud of our work in, the, in our communities. We, Dean and I do community-based participatory research. We focus on community engagement. We want to make sure that the information we provide is palatable, pardon the pun, that is meaningful and it's in their own language. Uh, training the trainers or creating effective programs that are culturally appropriate is what we do. We have an online brain community platform called the Neuro Academy, where we have daily interactions with individuals, disseminating brain health. But, you know, we, all, we go into the wonky, nerdy science, but at the same time, we talk about how do we make a cashew sauce, you know, or how do we stay away from sugar? Uh, and there's this beautiful weekly live conversation. Our work, which we won the National Academy of Medicine Award, is in the disparities uh, populations where we're training brain health coaches in African-American churches and other communities as well. These are the books that we're, we wrote, both and I, The Alzheimer's Solution in 2017, The 30-Day Alzheimer's Solution in 2021. Really proud of them. This is how you can stay in touch with us. I'm so grateful for you all to be here to listen to this conversation about nutrition and brain health. Thank you all so much.